coming at you. Good Tuesday, everybody. Welcome once again to BTL Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Yes, we have a guest in studio today. Matthew, he is stranded in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have some bad weather on the move here in Oklahoma. So Matthew is home, and we want to welcome the man that's going to come in studio every now and then, Mr. Brad Hallman. Bradley, thanks for coming in. Pinch hitting for the grasshopper and uh we're gonna dive into some stuff and kind of break down what you did last time on the recent flw stop on lake toho yep sounds good glad to be here marcus uh definitely missing matthew just like you are <laughs> yeah matthew uh he was on fire yesterday dude he, he kind of came out of his shell yesterday and said some things that were uh all very good and uh you know, I know he would like to be here, but at the same time, brutal weather on the way here in Oklahoma, man. Yeah, you know, I was thinking on the way over here um, how nice it's been for me. I've been kind of down south for a while, and I've actually done more fishing this year in the months of January and February than I think I have ever done. And it feels like we're almost in mid-stride of season. And, and It's only February. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's only February. So good show today. We're going to break down Toho. With Bradley, we're also going to have Paul Mueller on, who who got the W this past weekend at Lake Lanier. Uh, he was scheduled to be on yesterday, had some phone issues, but we have already spoken with him this morning and looking forward to talking to him about the giant spots that he caught on Lake Lanier, Bradley. Yeah, it's a wonderful place. <laughs> you like that place, don't you? <clears throat> I liked it last year. Yeah, you did. All right. Uh, I want to get into something real quick before... Uh, we do anything else. And I really need to, I, I want to straighten something out that happened from yesterday's show. Bradley, yesterday I put together some statistical data. And the reason that I did this on the first two Major League Fishing BPT stops is I just wanted to have a record kind of like the Elias Sports Bureau has. All right. Are you familiar with the Elias Sports Bureau? No, I sir. ESPN refers to the Elias Sports Bureau all the time on these kind of obscure but somewhat normal stats in baseball, basketball, football, all the major sports. So because Major League Fishing is so different, I thought, you know, somebody needs to keep track of these kind of obscure stats. So that's what I did. So I had two pages oh of stats. And, dude, I got a couple of emails. And once again, folks, I really appreciate the emails coming in, the feedback, the comments on YouTube, everything else. Outstanding job by the listeners and the viewers. But uh, there were a couple of emails that came in, and there were some people that were somewhat upset. And me and Matt talked about it. I was like, why were, why were they upset? Well, then I continued to read, and... and they thought that I was trying to make a comparison to a, a regular five-fish tournament. And that's not the case, people. All I'm doing is putting together statistical data that is based upon the way that they conduct a tournament. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I wasn't trying to go, oh, well, you know, the, uh, the shotgun round heaviest leading weights – after the shotgun round, is Marty Robinson 56 pounds? I wasn't trying to make a comparison. I'm just stating factual, statistical information that we're going to have to follow now because we've never had anything like this before, Bradley. Well, tell me the controversial part. What's the, what's I, I guess he thought <laughs> these, these two individuals thought that I was trying to compare Major League Fishing to Bass, and that's not what I was trying to do. You can't you can't do that because it's so unique. It's two to, it's apples and oranges or whatever you want to say. All right? All I was doing was we have two events. We have two events to take some data and crunch some numbers and put some statistics together to where now at least after this season we're going to have a pretty good statistical pool to pull from and see okay, what is the strategy? Well, based upon the numbers so far, you need to average right around 1.9, 2.0 pounds 
in order to have a shot at continuing to advance. All right, based upon the average numbers that you're going to catch. You're not looking at anything the anglers won't be looking at at the end of the year. I, I, I wouldn't think so, but hey, I, I, I was not in any way <clears throat> trying to use this statistical data to compare the two because you can't. So you're basically saying the guys that are catching more smaller fish are doing better on average than the guys that are carrying, catching fewer larger fish. Well, and, and when you look at it as a whole, all right, because – the first three rounds, all, all you're looking at is, okay, who's going to make the cut? Mm -hmm. 20, mm -hmm. then 20, right. and then you get to 40, and right. then 10. So you have those kind of obscure stats like, okay, what's the heaviest weight to win a shotgun round or an elimination round but not win the tournament? You see what I'm saying? Yep. It's like, who is the who has the most home runs in Major League Baseball without winning a World Series? Just obscure kind of stats, but the stats speak for themselves. So uh, one of the other stats is, all right, what was the lowest weight to make the cut in each round? All right, so once you compile and get more data based upon these events, you're going to be able to make a much, much better conclusion on what do you want to shoot for? You know, based upon the averages and based upon the data. I was not, once again, I was not trying to compare what Major League Fishing is doing compared to what FLW, Bass, or anybody. Because it is its, its own unique product. And it's going to have a whole new set of statistical data that we've never seen before in professional fishing. Agreed? Yeah. It's a totally different strategy. Yeah. It's a totally different format. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to come out different, those numbers. Yeah. Yeah, so there you have it. All right, uh, Bradley, uh, I know we're going to ha have Paul Mueller on. We're going to talk yeah, a little bit yeah. about what he did at Lake Lanier. Uh, I don't really want to get into it, but let's be frank, dude. You, you didn't really knock the socks off at Toho <laughs> at the last event. <laughs> That's more than frank. Uh, yeah, I uh, missed that one by a long shot. We'll get into that a little later, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I never saw offshore hydrilla playing after a three-week cold front in Florida and warming and just – Kept thinking they were coming to the hill. Yeah. And, um, you know, had even mentioned and talked to some friends that were catching them offshore in the hydrilla, and I was amazed before and after. All right. We're going to get into that. Now, this week we have a central open taking place Toledo Bend. on Toledo Bend. And, dude, they're, they're going to have to, like, chip the ice off. Yeah, they're going to be better <laughs> bundled up. Bundled up. Uh, some interesting stats that, that I did a little research. They have 218 entrants per, on the pro side there, Bradley. Let me ask you this. Who has more anglers, the state of Oklahoma or Japan? Japan. Actually, they're tied. They really? each have yeah, eight anglers from Oklahoma, eight from Japan. Wow. Now, back in the day, 15 years ago, would oh, we oh, have on, ever on. thought that? What was the number again? Eight. Eight? That's it. Wow. Okay. All right, that's a big number for Japan, but for Oklahoma, not even double digits. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know what to read into that. Now, here, for the state of Texas, 69. The state of Louisiana, 38 anglers. So you've got 117 anglers out of the 218 from Texas and Louisiana. Yeah, It is the Central Open, though. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see what shakes down on that. I'm really, really curious. There are some guys that are fishing MLF that are fishing the Opens. Uh, I remember earlier in the year we had Gerald Swindle on, and he talked about how he was fishing it with his, I believe it was his nephew, kind of kind of show him the ropes and, right, right. and do all that. But I know uh, there are other guys that are fishing, Major League Fishing, that are fishing the Opens. So uh, we'll see how that shakes down. Uh, another state of interest in the Centrals is there are 18 anglers from the state of Alabama. A lot of guys. So you, you've got that core kind of Texas, Louisiana, Alabama. I, I can't remember. I think Arkansas had uh, a pretty good number. Let me see here. I've got my – Man, that is a very, going. very low number for Eight. Oklahoma, isn't it? What Dude, is, back what, in the day. Back in the day. Oh, yeah. 25, 35. Yeah. Maybe 45. Why so many? I, I Why so few? I don't know. I don't know. I was hoping you might be able to – to give us some insight on that. I don't know. I'd almost have to look at the roster and see who else fishing. It doesn't make well, sense. Here, let's see if I can uh, pull up my data here real quick. The number of the Texas guys was large too or not? Yeah, 69. 
69. All right, here's the Oklahoma guys. Uh, Brandon Ackerson. Okay. Uh, Toby Hartzell, who has qualified for the Elite Series twice and said, nah, I don't want any part of that. I'm just going to hang around here and take everybody's money. Uh, Keith Houston. You know who that is? No, I do not. Uh, Aaron Morgan. Okay, I know who Aaron is. Uh, Alan Nail. Eddie Norris. Brian Potter. And Andrew Upshaw. Upshaw? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, So a couple of names that are recognizable from that list, but... Dude, 15 years ago, you're dead on. It was it was 30, 40, even sometimes well, 50 guys from Oklahoma. 15 years ago, they were fishing three tournaments, and they were basically an Oklahoma, a Texas, and maybe a Missouri or an Arkansas. Yeah. Now the schedule is five. Is that correct? Uh, Yeah, with the championship. Okay. I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh. So that's going on at Toledo Bend, and then, dude, we are building up to the Bassmaster Classic and what's going to be just a weird, kind of strange, but very, very intriguing vibe with everything that's been taking place with these two organizations. I I don't know that it's really going to be that awkward. Um, I know people are talking about it a little bit and thinking about it, and I thought that originally when all this came about. Yeah. I don't know. Don't think so, huh? No, I think it'll be business as usual. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying it's not going to be business as usual, but I'm telling you, there's going to be a, a complete different vibe based upon this split and, and everything that's taking place. Now, do I think Bass is going to go above and beyond and, and try and make this one of the best classics that they ever have ever seen in the history of it? Absolutely. I don't think there's going to be any shenanigans or any side stuff going on. Uh, I think they're going to do their best to showcase the guys, no matter what organization that they have ties to, because it's all about the the epicness of this event. It but is the event. They're going to have a massive turnout for it. Yeah, I that agree. That place is going to be the background of where that thing is. You know, they're going to actually take off in downtown Knoxville, right on the river, right behind Neyland Stadium. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to be. Yeah. Epic. Do you epic. have? Was there a tie to Tennessee football that you had? Yes, at one time. That's what I thought. Yeah. What was that, Ty? Well, I was born in Roan County, Tennessee, and graduated high school in Roan County, Tennessee. See, you always thought I was Okie 100%. Yeah. I've been here since I I was 18. Dude, I remember you wearing a Tennessee hat sometimes. Oh, yeah. Go Vols. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, let's do this, man. Let's take a break uh, and and hopefully make contact with Paul Mueller. And he was very, very, very apologetic for missing the show yesterday. It was like, oh, man, I, I, you know, things when you win and, you know, Bradley, when you win the day after it it gets kind of chaotic. I mean, when you won your first FLW, what was what was some of the chaos that took place that following day? Can you remember one thing that just really sticks out the day after besides day five? That you had to do. I don't remember the day after as much as the Super Bowl that the, that night. That was Super Bowl night, and uh, it was finally time to settle down and just sit there and watch a ball game, eat some pizza with some family and friends. Yeah. But next day, I think we did. I think I did the first uh, day five actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. FLW had ever done. So we went out and did day five the next day. All right, cool. All right, we're gonna come back with Paul Mueller. Everybody, stay warm. Here on a Tuesday, we'll be right back. Sleek new design with easy control file. The clearest images underwater with uncompromising range. Live mapping from the touchscreen. View notifications, video, even Google Maps on screen. And for the first time ever, real time view of fish movements with live sight sonar. HDS Live. New from Lorance.
It's about the hours spent getting everything just right. It's the attention to detail. Good just isn't good enough. It's the years spent on the water day after day. When you tie on a bait by Strike King, you're standing on the shoulders of legends. Pros depend on hydraulic jack plates to get the best out of their boats. Do what they do. Demand Atlas performance. Atlas gets you from the bottom to the top in less than eight seconds, even with the big four strokes. And when you gotta turn right around and get that heavy load back up in rough water, Atlas's innovative design and American-made components will get you there with confidence. I'm Ott Depot. Just look for yourself. There's an Atlas jack plate on just about every professional's boat. The Atlas hydraulic jack plate. You can depend on it. Hey guys, Aaron Martins here. I'm going to be uh, telling you about a new product by Sunline. It's Siglon PE x 8. Uh, I've been using it almost extensively all year for my frogging, flipping, drop shotting, shaky heading, worming, jerk baiting. It, it's by far my favorite Sunline braid. I, I, and I honestly, this is, uh, I don't say this unless I think it's true, but honestly, it's the best braid in the market of any of the braids. Definitely check it out. It's, a price point line, $14.95 for 165 yards, and that, that could last you a whole year, just one spool with using leader material. So again, it's Siglon PE times eight. It's my favorite braid, and I think if you use it, it'll be your favorite braid too. AFCO has a new foul weather rain suit called the Hydronaut. Um, a lot of the features that I really like about it first is the speed vent hood. If it's raining out, you know, how a person gets wet is when you run down the lake and the hood comes down. With the speed vent hood, it's going to stay up. It has a camera mount in the pocket on the chest. The Hydronaut has a two-layer, 100% waterproof nylon shell. If you're interested in a rain suit that has a lot of cool features, it's going to keep you dry. You need to check out the Hydronaut from Africa. All right, we are back on a Tuesday, ready for our first guest of the week, besides having Brad Hallman in studio. Matthew, he is staying warm up in Tulsa. And uh, some bad weather, getting ready to roll in here in Oklahoma. And uh, the weather guys, man, Bradley, I like talking about the weather because they sure do hype it up. It's entertainment, <laughs> entertainment. And sometimes, sometimes, and most of the time, they are wrong. So uh, not too many jobs out there where you can get paid big money and be wrong. They're paid to entertain. <laughs> the worth of sky is falling. All right. A guy that got paid a lot of money, $100,000 this past weekend on Lake Lanier. Uh, he got it done with a massive final day, over 18 pounds on the final day, a rainy, nasty final day. And uh, we were scheduled to have him on yesterday, but I'm glad that uh, we're able to have him on today, so let's see if we can get him queued up, Bradley. Paul, you there, man? Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Sounds great. Uh, wow. What a final day on Lake Lanier, and congrats, man, $100,000, but uh, that that final day was impressive. And it was a struggle. Um, I thought... You know, I didn't know what to think because I, I struggled. I, you know, I, I had some missed opportunities, um, and it was right about noon, and I knew I was way behind. And you know, there's there's a lot of big spotted bass in that lake, and it was anybody's game on the final day. And after you know seeing the the results from the FLW tour, you're thinking in the back of your head that somebody's going to catch 20, 22, 23 pounds. 
And so, you know, when you're sitting on 12, 13 pounds, you're like, man, I am way behind. You know, noon rolls around, and uh, it was just one of those things where uh, you know, I had a little Bible verse on my hand, and it was basically uh, it's Psalm 37, 5. And it basically it says, and commit to the Lord, and it shall come to pass. And so I looked at it, and I felt like the Lord was telling me to go back to my primary spot. I looked at that verse as I'm running to that spot. I made about two casts, and I caught a five and a quarter. And I hadn't caught one that big all week. And I knew right there that I was back in it. I don't know, it was something, it was just like a piece. Yeah, I was excited uh, with the relief, but it was a piece that it was like, all right, time to time to get to work. And uh, and I knew I, was, yeah, I made the right decision. And then shortly after that, a half hour later, I caught a four, and that ended up being the the winning fish. So it, it was not an easy day. I mean, it looked like it was based off the weight, but uh, I didn't have many bites. And, you know, in one of those derbies, you know, a type of derby like that, if you lose one, one of those fish, you don't win. So, and I only won my 14 ounces. So yeah. it's kind of a nail biter. It's closer than I wanted it to be, but I'm thankful that, you know, that it came out on top. I'm curious, what was so special about the ridge, that deep ridge that you had found? You know, it just had a lot of deep water nearby. Um, but, you know, I just couldn't believe that it, that those fish would be there, you know, every day. Now, they wouldn't be there all day. It was kind of like they'd be there in the morning some days, and then they just kind of disappear. But they, they frequented it, and they just stayed there. So it was like, even if I, you know, came back to it on one of the days they weren't there, I'd start there in the morning. Uh, and I found it at the end of the day on day one. So I really didn't know what the potential of it was. Then on day two, I weighed like an 18-pound bag, and I saw more. I said, all right, so there's there's more here than I saw on day one. And then I didn't really weigh that good of a bag there on day three. Um, I just caught some off it. I caught the fish other places. And I had a really good school on day three in another place. And it just, man, I just lost three in a row there. It was kind of like a, <laughs> just like a train wreck day because I, I should have had, like, I figured she needed, like, 17, 18 pounds a day. And I figured I was, you know, I was below par that day. And, and uh, But thankfully, it wasn't, you know, they didn't catch them that good. I still had a shot going into it day four. I was, like, behind by, like, a pound and an ounce. And I knew I still had a shot. But, man, it was just, it was a struggle on the, on the final day. And just a lot of fish moved. The weather changed. And it's just a, it's a challenging lake to, to catch those fish consistently day in day out did you notice the blueback herring having an effect on any way that you uh attack the lake or your strategy as far as the baits and techniques that you use to catch fish yeah i mean you know those fish they move around with the bait so like if the wind changed direction which like it did from day three to day four it it, it blew like the complete opposite direction and i think you know just I haven't really watched up a little a lot of the guys did yet, but I got bits and pieces. Like, I know Zaldane, his fish moved. He had to move to different parts of the lake, more wind-blown stuff. Um, so it, it, they definitely move around. I, I still don't have blueback <laughs> lakes figured out. I'm, I'm new at it. I, I got burned on Hartwell in the Classic. Uh, I had a decent finish, but I was on really good fish. But I also didn't have that Garmin Pan Optics in that tournament. And, man, if I could take that back with me, man, who knows what happened because I was on some really good spotted bass in that one. And then that was the whole key for me is that pan optics. Um, that and their mapping, that Lakeview HD mapping, uh, just allowed me to find new spots each day and just kind of stay with the fish. And, you know, you just had a, I had several schools of fish in that tournament that I never caught a fish out of uh, because they had moved and I had no idea where they went. Just amazing. Wow. Uh, I want to go back to the to the deep ridge. Like, How deep was the top of the ridge, and then how deep was the water around the ridge? So basically what it was, it was kind of like a long point um, that in the beginning of the point, it came way out off kind of like a clay bank, you know, red clay bank um, mixed with rock and stuff, kind of a good you know type of bank for spots anyway. But um, it came out way off the bank, uh, it topped off to about like 29 at that point, and then it kind of, from there, it turned into that saddle, which was like a 45-foot saddle, and that saddle was surrounded by like 80 foot of water, so it was like super tight contours wow. on both sides, 
and then it would transition. It would kind of come back up again to like a 33-foot high spot that turned out to be more of like a hump, and then it would drop off. But I never caught him on the face of that. It was more about like either on the, you know, that drop off on each side of the saddle or dead in the saddle, like just right. But it was like where the actual saddle was, it really narrowed out. Uh, to like a ridge, so it was like a ridge slash a saddle. And the thing is, I think because that deep water was so close, those fish didn't have to move far because there was always bait coming to them. And the wow. thing is, like there was uh, there was loons every day. There was loons nearby, so that's a good sign when you see loons. And I know that from being up north, uh, it's just different bait fish up north with loons. A lot of the loon lakes they're smelt, so wherever you see those loons, you know they're smelt under them. And uh, it's the same thing with, with Lanier and the Bluebacks. Whenever you see those loons, there's bait. It, it may not be that there's fish there, but you know that there's, they're on bait. So it was cool to see that. And then you knew when you saw those loons every day, you're like, the bait's here. That's a good thing. All right. And, and you said that you found this spot on day two. It wasn't something that you found during practice? I found it on day one. Okay. So, so basically, uh, I've seen a lot of the lake. I tried to see as much of the lake as I could, you know. But uh, on day three of practice, I, I said I had to find. I have to find some ditches. I know ditches made play. They didn't play that much, but they were. Re- it was really key for me on day one. That's I caught the majority of my weight out of a deep ditch on day one, and then I stumbled onto this spot. Um, at the end of day one, and I made a couple calls off of it, and I literally, like I said, it was it was the Lake View HD mapping on my Garmin set with the depth shading. Basically, what I did is with with their depth shading, you can highlight certain depths, and I knew like 26 to 45 foot of water was like the sweet zone uh, where you where I found most of my fish in practice. So I had my depth shading set to where. I mean, stuff would stick out, and, and when I drove, I had a ditch nearby, and when I drove by it to go somewhere else, it just stuck out to me. I said, man, that looks really good. And the thing with these spotted bass is they remind me of smallmouth on how they set up on stuff. So the, the spot that I fished, that, that kind of a winning spot, if you will, is a classic deep water, wintertime, late fall smallmouth spot. So that's where I felt at home with it. And literally, the way I caught my fish is how I fished my home lake. Just slow rolling a swim bait and use that little rain's bubbling shaker on a, on a freestyle jig and do that little freestyle technique, which is basically you got a suspended fish, you know, mid screen. I can see that fish 50 foot away on my fan optics. I can fire that little three inch bubbling shaker out there, <laughs> let it go to where it's about above the top of that fish. And it's like a little crappie jig, and you just shake that sucker, man, and they just come up and suck it right in. It, and it, I thought I was going to do a lot more of that in the tournament, but it was so windy day two, day three, day four, that uh, you just can't really – you're not efficient doing that, so it's more of a swim bait deal. But had it been calm, I'd have done that more than the swim bait. All right, I want to go to the instant feedback. Nate from Connecticut has a question. It says, Paul, with a half-ounce jig head – were you getting hum, hung up and having to pop it free off of the rocks to trigger them? Well, uh, there wasn't a lot of heavy rock in the places that I was fishing. It was kind of like this. It was more like small gravel. And, and some of it, it wasn't rock at all. But um, a lot of the places, the, the obstacles that you had, but it, what helped you was having that, that tan optics to see where it was. There's a lot of brush in some of these places. So, obviously, with a, an exposed hook like that, you can't throw it through a brush pile. Um, so, you'd have to a lot of times fish around that stuff or try to get the swim bait over the brush. Now, if it was real tall brush, that's not going to happen, um, especially because you had a slow roll of the swim bait. But there was stuff that was just real short on that one particular spot. It's a real short brush. And I was able to kind of, I could feel it with my line. And that's, in, you know, why it's really important to fish braid with that technique. Because you can feel a lot more and you kind of know when that snag is coming. So I kind of reel up a little bit. And sometimes I could get that swim bait to just get on top of that brush. And I did catch a couple of fish that way. Because they do hang in it. They relate to it. But they weren't, they, they, they just never kind of buried into it like I thought they may. Um, I never really caught them. You know, they, they would be near a brush pile, but they'd never really be in it. So it was kind of interesting because I thought for sure, I mean, because I fished 
Lake Lanier, one of them, as a co-anchor in the course of 2010, and we were drop shot. Mm -hmm. So, like, immediately you thought, well, hey, you know, there's so much brush in the lake. You know, there's got to be a few brush piles that you could do that. But it just, they weren't set up that way this week. All right, Mike in New York wants to know, did you ever find anything shallow, and did you use anything like uh, any other hard baits or crank baits? Yeah, on day three, see, I would rather crank than eat, okay? So, I, and it's, it's actually a disease sometimes because <laughs> if I get on a cranking bite, I don't want to do anything. So it, I really had to discipline myself this week to try. I knew you could catch them cranking, and I got on that bite, Day three of practice, it was sunny and it was windy, and I was catching them like in eight to twelve foot of water cranking. And uh, I was like, man, maybe that's a maybe that's a backup plan. But I knew it was going to be one deep. And there's just too many big ones deep, and I caught bigger ones deep, and that's probably what persuaded me to stay deep. But uh, I tried it on day one for about an hour, but kept it honest, and it never worked. And it was that was a blessing in disguise because, like I said, if I get on a crankbait bite, I'm, I'm I'm going to stick with it. But lo and behold, a lot of guys did well well with the crank bait line. But I just feel like you couldn't, like, under those conditions that we had and the changing of weather, and you know, I just felt like you weren't going to win with it for four days. How many guys do you think were as fishing as deep as you were, Paul? I, I really don't know. I just know Zaldane was, um, obviously, you know. Uh, but I, I think there was a lot of guys deep, but I, I think guys caught up deep. Some days, and it was hard to adjust each day. That's and like I said, I mean, for me, for me, the advantage is that pan optic. There's a lot of guys that don't have that, so it's hard to adjust because, like, with, with pan optic, basically what it is, it, it, it's a transducer that's on the trolling motor that's looking forward. So I'll have it set at 80 foot, and what I learned in practice right away is these fish are extremely boat shy, not with the motor, with the actual boat. If you got near some of these fish, if you were 30 feet away mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. fish that were 30 to 45 foot of water, That's they right. knew the boat was over them, and they, they wouldn't stay there. So it's amazing to have that, to know that. And so, but also, like, I could pull up to a spot within two minutes, I knew if they were there. So I wouldn't waste a lot of time, and I, I was able to move around. But it made me efficient. It made me adjust each day. And it obviously helped me catch fish because I caught fish that I saw out in front of the boat that if I had got over those fish, there's no way you're catching them. That's awesome. Because they're just too spooky. That is awesome. So. All right, I actually have some video queued up right now, and it was that five-pounder that you caught on the final day. Uh, miserable weather. You look cold. It's The wind's blowing a little bit. But what's going through your mind right now hooking up with this five-pounder? Put it in the boat. <laughs> uh, that fish, that fish, the camera didn't show it, but that fish came up about. I had a super long cast with that swim bait, and that mm. fish came up about midway. And when it came up, it just started walling, and I, I couldn't tell how it was hooked, but it made me nervous because none of them really jumped on me. And I said, What the heck is that thing? Is it a large mouth? Because it was big. I was like, Dude, is that a large mouth? That's so why I was like, All right, this is a big. And then I seen it, and I said, Oh my gosh, it's a magnum spot. And so when it came by the side of the boat, it started jumping again. And I just literally, I would have went swimming after that fish, which I know was legal, but <laughs> it looked like I was about to go swimming after. I didn't care. I was getting my hand on that fish. And when I got my hand on that fish, I, I let some emotion out, man. It was, it, I knew that was a, a game changing fish. And, uh, man, what an awesome fish. And, and to catch it on the final day, you know, I hadn't caught one that big in practice at all. I hadn't caught some fours, but. What a what a beautiful specimen, man! I mean, I'll, I'll never forget that catch. Um, just an awesome fish. All right, several people on the instant feedback want to know: Did you have any followers when you were catching those fish that deep? Oh yeah, I mean, it was amazing because, like, uh, and and I, and guys that watch live, they probably saw it, but uh, I would hook them sometimes. I catch one. And, you know, it's no, you're not going to rush that fish. You got to take your time. They do a lot of these vicious head shakes. They, they bulldog you. And the thing is, like, we can't shoot the net in, in this format. So you don't want to rush those fish to the boat. You, you want to tire them out. So I would just let them do what they did, tire them out. And then when they were ready, I'd grab them. So I would, you know, I had, 
you know, spot lock on my old track side, the boat would stay in one spot, which is really critical because I had like a sweet spot cast. I knew exactly where I needed to cast on the bank. Uh, you know, I cross triangulated with something on the bank, so I knew exactly where I needed to cast each time. But you'd, you'd hook a fish, and it would take forever to get that fish in the boat, and then I'd see them on the pan optics right under the boat. And most of the time, they you couldn't catch them because they, you know, by the time you grabbed the bait or whatever, they were gone, and uh, and they would get spooky. And so a lot of times you'd have to kind of let them reset on on the on the deal. And and there was times like in the morning, I felt like they would just shut off eventually. You'd catch a few and you'd pull the whole school to the boat, and uh, then you'd have to leave. But yeah, they definitely you would. I've never seen it like physically seen it. They wouldn't follow it to the surface. But I could see them on the pan optics that they were following that fish. I mean, there was a school there for sure. Wow. Are you fishing the opens? No, I wish I wish I was going to Toledo Bend though. But I don't know. They said it's been real windy, and I, you know when it's real windy on those boat lanes, man, you kind of take a pound. And so it's it, I, not a bad thing to be driving back home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bradley, anything else? I, I, for think, I think it was just a very impressive win overall. I mean, what he's talking yeah. about and the things he's talking about are very technical. This is not something that you just roll out there on a Saturday afternoon and figure out. Um, the depth of the fish alone, you know, when he starts talking 35, 45 feet, uh, sitting in a saddle of a somewhat of a blow-through type situation yeah. that bluebacks like, um, just extremely, extremely critically difficult to get all the technical parts of it and then, and then the power of his units. Yeah, yeah. That's great stuff, man. Uh, I bet you can't wait to get home and take that check to the bank. Uh, first thing I'm doing. <laughs> Hopefully the bank will take care of you when you deposit a check that large. They're, they're going to look at me like, is this real? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's good stuff. All right, man. Uh, I, I'm glad we got to hook up today, and uh, appreciate you taking time out on your way home. And a great, great job. Fantastic final day performance there on Lake Lanier. And uh, wish you the best the remainder of the year, man. Yeah, Paul. Super, super impressive, hey. man. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you guys having me. All right. Be careful going home. All right. All right. Take care. Take care, man. There you have it, Paul Mueller. And uh, that was crazy footage, wasn't it? And it was. Catching that awesome. last fish. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, tell us, what's it like catching those huge spots, man? I, he's doing it so different. I mean, he's light-lined all the way out yeah. and, and so deep. And uh, um, I'm really impressed with all of the, the, the technicality of everything that he had going there, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. All right, Bradley. It is that time. And uh, you were requested by a number of people out there to have you back on after each FLW tour event and kind of break down the thought process, the preparation, and more importantly, the performance. And we kind of opened the show by saying, dude, you, you, you didn't do that well. No. This last one. No. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your prep work going into it first. I mean, how did you feel going into it? What did you do to get ready for it? Uh, you, obviously, you've had a ton of experience on that lake. What was kind of the game plan? The game plan was was pretty much, you know, we, there's there's three or four areas of that lake: the North Shore, uh, the Jack Slough area of Kissimmee. Uh, Kissimmee's the one that's going to fire. If there's current, then you know, then you get a little bit of the canal stuff. So basically, we were checking and spending time in in productive areas of the lake. Um, there'd been a real long cold front leading up to that event, and there was the expectation by all that we would have this huge movement with the weather pattern that we yeah. had coming in in the 80s all week long, and we had it. Um, practice for me personally was was pretty good. It wasn't bad. It was good. I had one day that I could have been over 20 and, um, you know, had some bites the other days and was pretty productive. Um, I couldn't get the Jack Slew deal going. Um, I, I was down there multiple times, lots of hydrilla, spent a lot of time in there, could not get bit, just never found that group of fish. Um, actually, I personally slipped off to Tiger Lake and, and uh, spent – you know, a little bit of time out of two days over there also, yeah. just kind of off the beaten path. And uh, there wasn't any high drilling and tiger. Um, it was more, you know, just Kissimmee grass and, and the arrowheads and just natural Florida. Mm -hmm. And it's really target fishing, which is something that's kind of up my alley because, I, yeah. you know, I'm just an eye-oriented guy. But um, 
once the event came, the locks became such an issue for everyone. Um, large field, and I think the lock holds 12, 13 boats max. Um, so I know the first morning I was boat 120 something it was my draw and I, I i just went straight to the lock i didn't even try to fish or waste time I, I wanted through that lock as quick as i could get there and i think i made my first cast at 8 45 so we took off at seven so i mean it was a long time and it, it really the lock doesn't take that long it's just getting 13 boats in there and then them going down in the process right. coming right. back and opening gates so we, we we fought that coming and going both ways um which is with any lock so <clears throat> the first day I decided not to go to North Shore um, right off the bat because it was so late in the morning and um, I knew a lot of the guys had already been down there for well over an hour uh, on top of that grass bed. And I decided to go try to hit some little off-the-wall places that I had and had some bites. And, I mean, I went through some of them. They were on the bank, bank. <laughs> and uh, no, nothing. I uh, never had a bite out of any of them. And then when I finally did roll through North Shore, I think I stayed there maybe an hour or so, maybe an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, caught a couple of little fish and didn't stay. There's no doubt that, you know, when it was over, it was the same thing. It was it was the same areas that you see, North Shore, right. you know, uh, right. Jack Slew. Um, I mean, Jack Slews were Clawson won the classic out of. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, nothing's changed. You know, it's it's still, you know, the, the one thing that really surprised me, I think the most, what really was going on there was was that the big hydrilla beds ruled, period. So where the big hydrilla beds were is where the biggest populations of fish were, along with the larger females. Yeah. And that place was still what it's always about. It's always about a big bite. I mean, right. I don't. Everybody down the line, if they've had a good day, they've got a seven pounder or a six pounder at least in their bag. Um, it just it makes all the difference at the end of the day. But <clears throat> um, where was I going with this? Oh, the hydrilla. The hydrilla was was just a predominant player. So what really shocked me, and I'm sure shocked some. Um, was that the offshore hydrilla, the way out stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like I said, we were waiting for this big push and, and everybody was expecting it to come. And then Buddy, you know, wrecks them out there in the middle. Buddy Gross. I'm telling you, in the middle of Lake Toho. But massive quantities of hydrilla, though. The largest hydrilla bed on the entire chain right now. <laughs> we would drive through the, we were driving over the mats of it to get to the lock. You know, we're all yeah. racing down there every morning. So, you know, 99% of us, went right past right. it and buddy was sit out there you know with a couple other guys and it was the largest grass bed in the entire system it was beautiful the bottom end of toho the hydrilla was gorgeous yeah, yeah. so uh a number of people on the instant feedback want to know did you watch any of the coverage that the bbt had prior to the tournament don't know that i did <laughs> <laughs> i it, i mean do you think it would have helped you are, are you that kind of guy that wants as much info as you can possibly get going into an event? Um, did I watch any of the MLS? You lost me on the BBT part. Yeah. Yeah, we all watched that driving down. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we're, we're dangerous on the road, dude. We BPT. Could, we could have wrecks <laughs> um, with uh, all Wait, the information. You got the, you got the phone mount right there where you're watching oh, it? Oh, yeah, it's terrible. We all do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, so you did watch then. society, yes, yes. So what were you thinking when you got down there after watching all that? Um. You know, like, like, like you were talking about with some of your numbers. I yeah. Mean, as far as competitors, we're looking at, you know, they're different formats, guys. I mean, yeah. they're different. Yeah. And the strategies are different. And so the value of some things that are really good, yeah. you know, the other way around sometimes are not. But, um, you know, some of the things you obviously would look at, a lot of the uh, larger fish that they caught, you know, the areas that they came from, yeah. um, th there's no doubt that I, I don't know exactly where they were, but it sure appeared that Sprague and uh, Takahiro were probably sitting on North Shore. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tak caught a seven-something one day when I was watching. Um, I, and that was one of their last days at Toho. Um, there was obviously some grass in the, um, the, the the lake. The I forget the name of it. The one right below Toho. Uh, Zach Burge was in there and right. had a really good first couple of days, and it looked like he was doing a lot of trapping, offshore grass fishing. So yeah, I mean we're definitely um, using every tool to our advantage. Okay. Uh, when you take a look at what Buddy Gross did, and obviously you kind of described what he was doing, is that. Is that lake and, and all the groups of, of lakes that are on there, is it more of a 
an area thing than it is a pattern thing where you get into an area and you just kind of milk that area? Or is it something that you can duplicate one day and then you make a move no. and fish a different area? What's no. the style on that, Bradley? It's a Florida deal. It's Florida one-on-one. Um, you've got to be where the big females are. Okay. And they are not moving usually from where they are sitting. If, if, if they quit biting, they just quit biting. And you've got, you may have to find some fish that are biting somewhere else, but no. Um, it's it's a rotation deal. North Shore is a perfect example. Uh, I started there day two, and um, I had an area there where I'd caught a seven, and a friend of mine right across from me had caught one over six in practice. And I mean, you know, this is a big grass bed, but right. but in a small area of that grass bed. Right. And I went through there, and I tinkered around for two and a half hours, um, along with other boats. Right. There's fifteen or twenty of us in there, and then I just kind of moved on down the line on through the grass. You're just looking to get bit. Everybody, we're winding. And then you start hearing things, you know, three hours later, and it was actually one of my roommates that pulled in, and he was down by where I had started. Yeah. Well, you know, he's 22 pounds later. You know, <laughs> he's got two sixes, and, um, you know, it, it's chatter baits and, and, and rattle traps and, you know, moving baits, but um, it's also about timing, you know, sitting yeah. there whenever that fish decides to, that little group of fish either swims in or sits up on top of the grass and decides to feed. All right. Uh, a couple of questions on the instant feedback. Kevin in Illinois wants to know, do you think that there's too much focus on the leagues and not enough focus on the anglers with everything that's taking place? I don't know. I mean, I, I think that right now, honestly, I mean, my opinion, and I've been doing this a while, um, <clears throat> I think there's more opportunities for everyone right now. I mean, that is my true belief from – the MLF guys to the FLW Tour guys to the Elite Series guys. I mean, there are so many opportunities. Opens, Coastas. Um, there's more of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, just mathematically. Um, I didn't think that this sport could grow and grow. Dude, it's growing. Yeah. Uh, Andy in Indiana wants to know, do you think the Tour should do everything they can possible not to schedule on top of each other? Say that again. Do you think that the tourists should do everything possible not to schedule on top of each other? Basically to where... We, we, it, we've always felt that way as English yeah. for years and years and years. But, I, you know, I understand their side also. It, if they were only running national tours, mm -hmm. then it would be a little easier to say, okay, let's not let's try to work together on this deal. But the fact that they have regional level events and, yeah. you know, from West Coast to East Coast, three to four different divisions... And then they start. You start getting into other stuff. BFLs, All Americans. It's yeah. just too much. I mean, it's everything. Let's just take FLW for example. Mm -hmm. It has to be everything in their power just to get a full season in right here w without worrying about anybody else. I mean, yeah. they've got holidays to worry about. Um, you know, we started uh, the first Costa in the uh, Central. Right, you know, down here in January, <laughs> on New Year's, basically. I yeah, mean, all most of those guys missed the New Year's holidays with their families. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that they don't, that's how they, you know, it's just so, it's just so busy. Well, so let me ask you this. Uh, uh, and once again, some people on the instant feedback have said this. Would, what would you think about a schedule that starts in the middle of the season and rotates through the holiday season into, say, like July to June to where you can actually get more events in then? Yeah. I, I, I've always enjoyed fishing in the fall. I like it. Yeah. Um, um, but you're going to have a problem with some of the, the the fall tournaments and starting in the in the summertime and going the other direction is is there's so many of these anglers um, that are so addicted to deer hunting that they're not <laughs> going to give it up. By the way, have you heard about this new deer disease that's going on? No. Oh, dude, uh, we're we're having Edwin on tomorrow, and you know he's a big hunter. Right. I, I've got to get his opinion on that. Yeah, that's all the rage. There's like 26 states. They're calling it the deer zombie disease. So it's not a good disease. It's no, a bad disease. Oh, no, 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 no. Has not been spotted in Oklahoma yet. Really? Yeah, I'll show it to you after the show. It's okay. crazy. Yeah, I hadn't seen it. Crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, let's see here. I'm curious, your, your post-game analysis after the event, let's kind of do it this way. What would you have done different based upon your performance that you had at Toho? I probably would have spent more time – in and I'm talking about in practice, I probably would have spent more time in the areas that we already knew that it was going down, um, especially after some time of 
getting a few bites in practice, and I would have probably just stayed. Because what ends up happening is, is you know, we're always trying to cover so much water um, through practice because we really want to know as much as we can about different areas and places that are going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, it's so spot related in Florida that once you kind of get one or two of those spots and then you add in a lock and lock time, you don't have a lot of time to do a whole lot else if you're going to go there. So what I would have done different is, is I would have spent more time in that area, less time checking other areas. And what I would have done with that time is I would have found more techniques that I could have gotten bid on. Okay. Now, I asked Mark Menendez this question when uh, they were at the Harris Chain. He had a great event he did. at Saw the that. Harris Chain. Yep. Is there anything that you do in Florida that you can actually apply to uh, lakes across the nation? Because Florida is so unique. And his response was, you got to slow down. The one thing in Florida that you have to do is you have to slow down and really pick apart. And when you looked at his performance on the Harris chain and some of the video footage from the live uh, footage, he he was slowing way, way down. He was trying to get five, six, seven bites a day. Mm -hmm. What what do you think about that? Is there things that, that come out of Florida that you can actually apply across the nation to guys that and girls that like to fish on the weekends? Oh, absolutely. The grass fishing is the same. I mean, hydrilla is hydrilla, millful is millful, the yeah. way that they relate to it, the schools in them, the way they feed around them, um, very much the same. Um, I think in those aspects alone, it is it is very much like the rest of the country. All right. Uh, let's talk about Seminole next stop coming up here yep. in yep. a few weeks. Uh, yep. What's your game plan going into that? It's actually a lake that I've never been to before. Really? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, I don't know how I've missed Seminole through the years, but I have. Um, I actually stopped on my way home and fished for uh, three days to uh, just kind of look at it and learn the lay of the land. It is um, It's a little bit more difficult navigation than I thought it would be. Um, it's, uh, it's a place that's uh, very... Um, uh, the, the the overall uh, size of it is big. Um, you can't just, you know, it's it's narrow in all places, but mileage wise of of running, you know, basically you've got three different main feeder rivers into yeah. it, and um, and there was a lot of watercolor. The water was high. Hey, I'll tell you one thing. Um, that place looked like Hiroshima. I really, mean, it is amazing what that hurricane did to that yeah. place. You guys wait till the cameras come on on that place on some live stuff. Really, I mean, it is terrible i mean the houses it's sad i've never seen anything like it i mean i have never seen i'm talking <laughs> the woods and the trees are, are pine trees and they're yeah. about 15 foot in the air they're broke off every single one of them it looks like you just went there and just stuck matches up through the wow woods. It, it's 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 incredible huh is it is it bigger than lake eufaula here in oklahoma that's the biggest lake that we have here in Oklahoma. No, but it has those same aspects. As That's kind of what I thought. Run yeah. and run and run and run and run. I don't think the place is going to fish really, really, really big. Yeah. But um, I mean, there's a lot out there. I mean, um, is there a lot of dead water? There's definitely some dead water in okay. that place. But but it's got a lot of vegetation and stuff too. The other thing that really surprised me about it is, is you know, you, you would say it says Lake Seminole and in Florida, the Florida Georgia line. Man, this place is a river. That's what it is. No, seriously. <laughs> really? I'm, I'm talking a running river, just like the Arkansas. I'm talking buoys, navigational channels. Yeah. Um, when you get out of them, it becomes very difficult to navigate. Um, it is a river system. So, um, so did you do more looking than fishing? Absolutely. I did okay. a lot more riding than I did than I did fishing. All right. Yep. All right, man. Good stuff. Well, uh, hopefully you will bounce back. Uh, I know that is not a vintage performance, at least your first two events that you've had. Uh, going into that, hopefully you did a lot of homework on it and you saw some things that are going to appeal to you and your yep. style and yep. everything that's going to go down at Seminole. Uh, what else you have going on? Are you going to the Classic this year? Some I people yeah, yeah. wanted to know. Yeah, I was actually talking to my wife about that yesterday. Yeah, looking forward to going to Knoxville. All right, and and we've discussed that event uh, numerous times on this show and I, I believe it's going to be probably the most attended Classic think, in the history of the Classic. I think you're probably right. I mean, that place, the fire marshal is going to have to be yeah. on uh, high alert on how many people that they pack into that arena. That arena is massive. I think it's one yeah. of the largest in the nation, so it yeah. should be able to hold everybody. Tennessee, Knoxville, special place, isn't it? That campus mm-hmm. is gorgeous, I think. Uh, the fishing, who knows, man? I, I'm sure everybody's talking about Odd Defoe 
and uh, some of the things that he's going to be able to do, being very, very familiar with that area. Uh, but the vibe going to be weird. Uh, at the same time, I think you're going to see some very, very unique situations, not only from a off the water standpoint, but I think you're going to see some unique things on the water that we haven't seen for a long time. Yeah, Fort Loudon's a really good place to play the game. Um, yeah. It's going to be interesting, and Odd is going to be a you know obviously the the head the upfront favorite going in with hometown stuff, but Knoxville is going to be such a special place. The crowds are going to be really really big i don't think any of the other stuff's gonna matter yeah yeah we'll see all right man anything else you got coming up on the uh schedule or uh, or might have to find it can you believe this we what's have, that we have a bfl in the state of oklahoma next weekend at on Gr- saturday at grand lake right grand lake of the are you going i think i might have to slip up there <laughs> <laughs> what's the water temp like man 42 43 well you know everybody comes in march and we have these tournaments and everyone's yeah. always upset the, the rule of thumb generally is that they bite pretty good in february it's yeah. the month of march that they don't so you know ah, uh, yeah i may go up there and tinker around a little bit and See some of my <laughs> old buddies. Some, take some money from some I don't people. Know about that's, that, but at least have a good time. Why, yeah. All right. Uh, folks, tomorrow, a great show. We're going to have Edwin Evers on, have him talk about his win on Lake Conroe. And uh, did you see his eight pounder that he caught? I did not. Caught it on a drop shot. Had a boy. The last 10 minutes. Really? Muddy water. He was back in this little kind of. It's not a creek, but. Was, was just he like, throwing the big drop shot too with the other guys? The, the flip shot? The 15-pound test line? Or was he, was I, I don't he, know. We're going to find out. Okay. I don't know. All right. I, I, I did not see when he went into detail. I didn't look. I thought, okay, I want him to, to come on and talk. But, I mean, he was kind of dinking around, you know, catching a buttload of fish. You know, I can't remember what the number was. I think, let's see here. If I can look at it real quick. Uh, the number of fish that he caught was... He's amazing. 26. He caught 26 wow. on the final day. He's, he, you know, the first two events that we've watched with him, you know, he's he's around that, that day one, day two. He's just like barely around that cut line. And you're thinking, man, Edwin's yeah. not going to make it. And then he just, every single time, he just comes on stronger and stronger. Yeah. So we're going to have him on. Uh, <laughs> when he caught that eight pounder in the last 10 minutes, though, it was, uh, you know, this game's over. This is done. <laughs> right. Because Sprague was kind of making a little bit of a charge. And then Boyd was kind of, you know, pushing him a little bit. And then David Walker was making a move also, but an eight pounder slammed the door. I was kind of surprised that there weren't more large fish this time of the year on Conroe caught, but there was a nine pounder. Edwin caught that eight pounder in the last 10 minutes. So, uh, so far after two events, we'll, we'll see. I mean, Edwin, he's got a second place finish and a first place finish. So obviously he's leading in the points. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sounds like Sprague's not doing too shabby either. No, talk about mm-hmm. you know him going from the FLW tour to to being yep. uh, a star on the the BPT right now, yep. and a lot yep. of people are going to become aware of what Jeff Sprague is all about. So uh, he's a stick man. He yep. he can he can catch him. He's a young man's put in a lot of time. So he's all right. all right. Well, the Nature Boy, the former Nature Boy, the Grasshopper Matthew Pangrak, he will hopefully be back in studio tomorrow. Right here, we'll have Edwin Evers on and uh, dig into what went down at Lake Conroe. So uh, awesome. thanks for coming in, Bradley. Thanks for having me. Always welcome. Yep. Great way to break down what you're doing over on the FLW Tour. And we will be back tomorrow, folks. Everybody be safe. Try and stay warm. We're out of here.